to recognize that every single person you meet is struggling. You tend to see other people as completely formed individuals. And we need to recognize that everyone we meet, every single one of them is looking for significance. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Produced by Soapbox Media. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. This is going to be a a cool joint podcast with my co-host, Andy Vasily, of the successful Run Your Life podcast. Andy's a friend from way back. We went to public school together. And Andy helped me set up my podcast a couple years ago and get started with a few hints uh, and tips. His Run Your Life podcast is focused on physical fitness and uh, self-realization. A few weeks ago, Andy hosted a uh, a talk in Windsor. It was called a Pecha Kucha Night. That's, I guess, Japanese for chit-chat, and it's meant to stimulate discussion. And I went there, and I was a, an invited speaker at his talk, and it was a great night and it was nice to get back in touch with Andy and we decided we'd do this joint podcast to uh, to maybe go over how we've grown in our podcasting careers, what we've learned uh, and where we're going with it. So I hope you enjoy this. If you do, please hit like on your podcast app. Please share it with your friends and come join us on the Facebook group, The Rational View, if you'd like to chat. So Andy and I go way back. Uh, we were uh, buddies in public school and went to, to Ruth and public together uh, many, many moons ago. Uh, and yeah, we just kind of got hooked up again through social media. And uh, Andy ha- invited me to uh, do a talk uh, at a at an event he was hosting in Windsor this summer. Uh, it's called the Pecha Kucha. Uh, and this is something I'd never heard of, and, and it sounded a little silly in the name, but it was kind of cool. Um, it's, I guess it's Japanese for chit-chat, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Informal chit-chat, stories by mouth kind of thing. And it's a really cool format. So I said naively that, yes, I'll, I'd love to do a talk. It's only six minutes long. Uh, so it's kind of a very high-level, fast-paced talk. I thought, oh, this should be very easy. The format of the Pecha Kucha is kind of cool because it's um, you basically have to have 20 slides in six minutes. So 20 seconds per slide uh, and you have to be on a timer effectively. So your slides, <laughs> if you get out of sync, you're done. Uh, and you really have to have, you know, like just your three sentences. Per I'm, I'm very used to talking to slides and conferences and such things. And I I always give like two minutes a slide uh if at a comfortable rate but this is 20 <laughs> seconds a slide it is not comfortable at all it, it's a it's a very difficult uh, thing but it was a lot of fun so i i, I put to put together a podcast and or a pecha Kucha talk and gave it at the podcast and andy did a pecha Kucha talk and also uh another of our friends from public school was there and yeah. gave a talk so it was it was really cool to to visit and and hook up and and reconnect after after such a long time so yeah, it, yeah, and there was some some great talks there. Uh, I talked about polarization, which is one of the topics that we've tackled on the Rational View. Um, how to communicate science, how to bridge the gap on polarized issues, uh, how to provide the tools of science to analyze arguments, uh, and also tools of communication. I think is it's something that science scientists aren't taught. Right. You're not taught communication in science class. You're Mm -hmm. you're taught how to use the tools of science, but not enough is done. And there's just not enough. And maybe this is something that it's turning, turning around with a lot of us. This is, you know, this is kind of why I got into this is that so much anti-science sentiment is out there in the world these days. And I wanted to kind of turn that around and, and mm-hmm. reach a larger audience. And so your advice on, on how to get the podcast started was, was very helpful, Andy. Uh, and, you know, so it was, it was great to, to talk to you and, and get kind of your ideas on, on what, to, how to focus and how to do all the, the technical details, mm-hmm. despite the difficulties we had today. 
Uh, you've been <laughs> exactly. doing this for for quite some time, right? You've how long have you been podcasting? I've been doing it for about seven years now, so I think I'm about. I think roughly 220 episodes in, but I probably have another 20 more episodes from previous platforms where I was experimenting and trying to figure out, you know, not my story, but my voice and what it was I wanted to share and who I wanted to connect with to learn from and to dive deeper into kind of the journey of of better understanding humanity through my own kind of lens, uh, which is well-being and mental health. And, and you know, hearing your talk that night, and as you said, it's 20 slides, 20 seconds, and they're, I, you know, you sent me your slides, and I pre-programmed them 20 seconds each, so there's no bailout. There's no, I want 27 seconds on this slide, and I'm okay with 20 on that one, but I need 40 on that one. Um, you know, it just, it's 20 by 20, six minutes, 40 seconds. So it was amazing to reconnect with you. And then hearing your podcast from the time that we connected and I had you on my own podcast, it really is a journey of learning, you know, and that's what I wanted to really chat with you about because our fields are different. You know, I'm in education, you're in science yet, you know, we're so connected in the sense of, you know, the common humanity is about learning. And what I want to share with you right now is a quote from Chris Hadfield. And then I have a question for you about it. But, you know, when you think of Chris Hadfield's journey into space, which is extraordinary, Chris Hadfield being up in the International Space Station took thousands of photos. And he just, you know, was so passionate about capturing the human experience from above and what he says is this he says that he had a chip in his camera and every time he took the chip out, out of the camera he had to put it into his pocket and zip it up so it wouldn't float away and by the end of the day he had a whole bunch of chips in his pocket and he essentially had the whole world in his pocket waiting for him to really look at and explore. And as he explored these photos later in the day, you know, looking through these photos he took, he said there's some magnificent, unexpected, intimate views of the world. And now what do I do with that? And he goes on to say that hopefully we are all students of the human condition, whether we mean to be or not. And as we get a little older and we gain a little perspective, he says, I think that we are truly getting, uh, what we're truly getting at is a collective understanding of where we are and what it means. And the best part of this is what it means to be human and how we can share this and how we can share the best of it. And what it means to each of us is an individual choice, but the more people we meet, the more you understand what battles people are fighting and the more you see the commonality of the human experience itself. And if you feel you have been enlightened, you have to share it. And what he talks about is having 45 to 50,000 pictures of that experience. And he didn't know what he wanted to do with it, but he felt, compa uh, he felt compelled to share this experience with the world. So he release these pictures in a kind of a coffee book, a coffee table book. But when you think about your own journey of learning, what is it that you feel most compelled to share now with the world based on your learning and, and where your podcast has taken you? That's, that's, a, that's a deep question. Um, I've been very lucky, uh, I think. To, uh, I'm, I'm happy how this has turned out because I didn't know how this was going to play out when I started. I was, you know, I wanted to do something kind of COVID came along and I had some spare time on my hands, not driving back and forth to work all the time. Um, and I wanted to, you know, think about how I could do things, you know, thinking forward to maybe my retirement or, or, you know, what do I want to do with my life now that I, you know, I've got my career, uh, in place and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of where I want to be career wise. I wanted to look into something new and 
I traded off a couple of different ideas and it took a long time to figure out that, you know, I could do a lot of fun things. I could, you know, golf, I could, you know, go curling or whatever would be fun, but I really wanted to do something that was meaningful. And that's, that's what drove me to podcasting. I wanted to do something that would maybe make a difference. And at the same time, it gets me to talk with uh, folks that I would not otherwise get the chance to chat with uh, and learn about, you know, amazing cutting edge research from the people that are doing the research. And I, I was like, wow, this is great. You know, I, I got to talk to Neil deGrasse Tyson. That was pretty friggin' cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and so what have I learned? Wow. I've learned a lot. Um, I've learned a lot about communicating and a lot about um, how to communicate better, um, how to interact with people across the divide better, to reach out across divides and listen uh, to people that I wouldn't otherwise have given a second thought to, I think. Um, and this is something that... And can I time out? Can yeah. I just do a quick time out? When you, when you think about the strengths that you developed early on, you know, that led you into science, the world of science, and do you feel you're, you're tapping into, obviously, your strengths, but in what ways have... I don't want to say weaknesses have been, you know, have been uh, weaknesses have been revealed to you, but strengths and weaknesses both. How it, how have you learned to navigate those through the podcast? So it's tapping into your strengths, obviously, of of being, you know, highly curious about the world and wanting to learn, but also it takes, you know, you, it takes a risk. You know, you you've got to take a risk to jump out, kind of. You know, it's a courageously bold risk to put yourself out there through podcasting because it's your voice, you know? So just speak to kind of that idea of strengths and weaknesses and, and what you learned about areas you wanted to better develop within yourself. Yeah, it, it's it's a, a bit of an ego trip uh, being a podcaster. You get, you know, you see the downloads and you see the numbers and it's like, oh, this is great. And then you see the comments and you make you know faux pas or you make a mistake or you say something wrong um and i think my weaknesses uh it, i i have difficulty admitting when i'm wrong that's that's something that i've learned uh is a is a challenge for me um and sometimes i won't even take a risk uh in case you know i could be wrong I don't want to to say anything, so I'm usually very quiet. And this is um, something that has, uh, you know, forced me to to go out on a limb a little bit and take risks and and you know put myself out there uh, at risk of being wrong. And in a lot of cases, you know, I'm talking about things that I don't know very much about. In fact, um, so it's a lot of humility, humility, but it's also um, uh, wonderful. Uh, to learn about these topics that, you know, I'm not an expert in, but I think I can, with my background in science, I can provide um, the, the skeptical point of view that's necessary to, to, to basically peel apart the wheat from the chaff effectively and to, to, to get to the, the best questions to ask. So I think that's a strength is, is, is asking the right questions and understanding, you know, when you're being sold a bill of goods uh, versus, you know, getting to something that can be backed up. So that, that's one of my strengths. I think that I, I bring to this and, and my speaking ability uh, was originally very weak, uh, but this was many years ago and I've been working on this for some time. I, I, been a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada for probably 20 years now, uh, the Ottawa chapter. And I, you know, often I had like a weekly uh, segment on there where I do the astronomy news. So I'd give mm -hmm. like a 10 minute or a monthly, I guess, monthly talk. I'd give like the 10 minute astronomy news update in front of like 100, 150 people uh, every month. And that really helped me with my public speaking confidence and, you know, going out and, and just you know, researching a new topic every month and talking to people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I was well set up that way. So I, I you know it, it's, it's really worked well for me in that, in that regard. I think a lot of different threads come together in this podcasting that, that, that work well for me. And, and, you know, as long as I can 
keep my uh, my hubris under control. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and humility, uh, I do very well. What about you? How how does your uh, podcasting uh, affected your outlook and and your strengths and weaknesses? Uh, what have you learned? Yeah, I think it's it's been such an amazing journey, and you start out very curious about the things you want to know more about, which reveals more about yourself and and what you're curious about and what you're trying to figure out and then tapping into these amazing resources and people around the world to have these continued discussions and then like you said it's this idea of communication so you talked about not being a very good communicator but really what what it is is not being very experienced in the arena of communicating to a wider audience right so then when you gain that experience Yes, you develop confidence, but you develop more of your voice and then you develop more of your uh, ability to uh, take risks and ask questions without fear of judgment and without fear of thinking, oh, that's a dumb question. No, that's a great question. Any question is a great question. There are, there are no dumb questions, you know? So it's that idea of being very comfortable uh, in asking the questions that you want to ask to tap into your own curiosities and wonderings and then to use that information to navigate and pivot and change your perspective and think oh i i used to think this but now i think this and that's the great thing is staying open minded to these different perspectives and and that has been a a big shift for me is like you know not going in with an agenda you know, I have my list of questions that I want to ask, but not going in really firmly holding on to any kind of beliefs and being okay to just open it up and say, what is your perspective? This is your context. This is your work. You know, we're both interested in this topic. Give me your perspective. And it's not shutting down their perspective, even if I disagree um, then it's saying, okay, well, what is in there? What what are they saying that will it has rattled me a little bit, you know, and will allow me to stay open minded and dig a little deeper, and then reach a point where you're like, ah, I now see it. I get what you're saying, you know, and then that just opens more doors of curiosity. So I think for me, it's been like really letting go of strong beliefs that I have and going in, into discussions and being very open-minded in regards to my learning and where this learning will take me rather than needing to uh, communicate what I think is right or what I believe to be right leading into that discussion. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely... Uh... It definitely makes sense. And I, I've learned a lot too, um, from in, in that regard about being open-minded and, and listening more. Um, I also want to, from, from the perspective of my podcast, I want to challenge people a little bit on the scientific aspects of their work. Uh, so I, I can be open-minded to a point, but I also want to make sure that I'm holding them to account onto the sci the principles of scientific knowledge and, and learning. Um, so sometimes I think maybe I don't challenge enough, but I also want this to be an open forum where people are comfortable to come on and, and discuss different points of view. And I think this is something we need in society because I think on social media, especially, it's very easy to uh, other groups of people or to um, you know dehumanize groups that are that are not your tribe. And I think that's one of the the basis of of a lot of the problems that we're seeing right now in social discourse and political discourse is that you know pick a minority and 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 make them other uh, so that you can demonize them or or whatever and score points and that that's just not going to work right it's 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 tearing us apart as a society so uh, I've been making an effort on my podcast to reach out. And branch out to other viewpoints that I would not normally listen to and try to learn from them. Uh, I've had uh, 
the director of the Vatican Observatory on the on the program, my brother, Doctor Guy, is <laughs> yeah. a, a Jesuit a Jesuit brother and a doctor, a PhD, um, running the Vatican Observatory. It's a great interview, uh, you know, and you know, he's very, uh, you know, he's a scientist. He understands the principles of science, and he doesn't let his faith um, interfere with his scientific principles, which. You know, you really have to if you want to be true to the principles of science. Uh, but he still holds these beliefs. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm open to listening to them. And maybe I, I will disagree with some of his premises. But, you know, it was a, it's great to learn from him and to hear uh, in an open-minded way what he had to say. And then, you know, I'm sure it speaks to some of my listeners uh, to, to see that you can hold both scientific and religious uh, principles. I, you know. A lot of people in the science, you know, get you know really into the hard science and 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 are into the internet discussions are are very dismissive of religion, and you can see this in in the um, very outspoken atheists, you know, uh, that are, are doing the talk uh, circuits uh, and ridiculing religion. But the, you know, these everyone you can't you can't say that half the population is stupid, right? Mm. You know, and maybe they're misled maybe they're they have different assumptions about things than you do uh we still have to share this world <laughs> we yeah. we have to get get by without you know coming to blows about basic things and and what i've learned is that you know most of us have very similar values and wants and needs and the differences between the sides are very small. You know, it, it's, it's, it's just very fine things mm -hmm. that, that separate right and left or, or, uh, you know, religion and science. There's not that much difference between the people. If, you know, if you met them at a barbecue, you would come up and shake their hand and, and have a good chat mm -hmm. with them. Yeah, but on the internet, you, people seem happy to, to swear at people and, and, and hurl obscenities and, and, it's 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 yeah there's something wrong with the with the medium i think that that needs to be addressed well you know just just to add to that one of my guests dr michael gervais who i talked about in the pecha Kucha, uh often talks about this very thin membrane between hope and despair you know and it's just this idea of what that thin membrane represents which is black or white you know and it it's it's so closely connected everything is so closely connected and as you say um the common humanity like everybody has the same wants needs desires goals they love their family they just tend to you know they love their family like we all do and they tend to just look at things from a different perspective but when you are engaged in discussions where you might feel triggered a little bit because you're holding true to your own core values and what you've come to understand about the world. How have you learned to navigate that space of uh, cognitive dissonance to be able to keep the discussion going? Because the way we use language is a very important skill, right? And you can shut somebody down really quickly in the tone of your voice and your body language and your choice of words. So have you had any moments on your podcast where you have felt, I don't want to say triggered, like deeply triggered, but you just felt a little bit of, you know, a little sandpapery, For shall sure, we yeah, say, yeah. you know, and, and then how have you learned to um, kind of be introspective and look at the way you are communicating and the words you're choosing and taking the deep breaths to be responsive rather than be reactive to keep the dialogue going so what do you what do you want to share in that respect yeah no it, it sometimes is very difficult in fact i i had uh one one guest on who is um almost diametrically opposed to some of my views on uh, energy uh i have a strong uh interest in nuclear energy for the transition from fossil fuels as as a required uh, aspect uh and you know the from a scientific point of view i've questioned all of the different uh 
concerns that people have. And I feel that, you know, although there are risks that if you look at them in relation to other choices, um, in my view, this is the best way forward. But there are other people who focus very tightly on the downsides of nuclear energy and, you know, don't compare them on a level playing field to the options. Like they don't look at the option of, well, if you don't have a nuclear, what is going to happen? And we're seeing that playing out right now in Germany. Uh, they're beholden to Russian gas because they shut down all their nuclear plants. And now they're Putin's holding the whole country hostage uh, to f finance his war in Ukraine. Um, so I had this guy on and he's, you know, very anti-nuclear and, and, you know, and just spouting stuff that's, I feel it's wrong. So you, you know, you have to, as you say, just take a breath and, you know, interact respectfully. I mean, I don't need to yell at people <laughs> to get my point across. I can, I can respectfully disagree. I can place my, uh, my opinion out there and he can place his opinion out there and, and we can, uh, agree to disagree. I mean, that's, that's fine. And I, you know, I, I can do that with, with religious people. I can do that with the anti-nuclear people and, you know, we don't have to come to blows over this. Um, you know, we can continue the discussion as long as I think the, the, the problems come when, uh, when when we start using alternative facts i think there are there are some people that are just not interested in sharing a reality with us and at that point you really can't have a discussion so what i like to do is look let's go back to the basics with someone like that you know do you agree that this that the world is round. Let's start there. <laughs> do you... <laughs> and some, Common sometimes that ends the conversation. <laughs> the right people. Uh, but, you know, you can get to a point where, okay, so we agree on this, we agree on this, we agree on this, and then this is where we disagree. Okay, and that's fine. You know, and in most cases, you're going to agree more than you're going to disagree, I think. You know, we, we obviously all want to have clean energy. We obviously don't want mass extinctions. We don't want uh, climate change to cause wars and famines. Uh, the disagreement is how do we get there? What's the best path to get there? And this is uh -huh. something that comes up. And I know I can have a respectful disagreement with someone, but I'm still going to go out and, and run a stand up for nuclear event uh, in Ottawa this fall to to provide information and to, you know, uh, try to spread the, the scientific, uh, understanding of, of, of what we've learned. So, you know, I, I'm happy to, to have these discussions and bring to light these things. And I think, you know, it's better to have, to have these discussions and, and understand, uh, what the opposition is saying and, 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 and look for paths that are, uh, least polarizing to, to come to an agreement. Yeah. And there is another, you know, I, I wrote down another quote from Hadfield that I would be interesting, interested in exploring a little bit here. But what, what he says is he was asked what advice he would give his 20-year-old self. And what he said is to recognize that every single person you meet is struggling. You tend to see other people as completely formed individuals. And we need to recognize that everyone we meet, every single one of them is looking for significance. They are trying to do the best that they can and they fail regularly. And they are within their own particular battle of their own life, so cut them some slack. Don't let them off the hook, but recognize the shared nature of being a human being. But let people be themselves and treat them more kindly for it. And I think in our platform podcasting, you have to take that stance, you know, like you can hold true to your core values and what you believe, but you invite people on to open the doors to very important discussions. And that's what you're doing through your Rational View podcast. And what I try to do is I try to bring people on to talk deeply about mental health, 
and well-being and purpose and meaning and fulfillment. And, you know, when you recognize that that person across the screen from you or sitting across the table from you that you're interviewing, most of my podcasts are virtually, but um, I do face-to-face podcasts, you know, a few times a year. But when you recognize that they're they're in it in the same way that you are and they have their perspective and they're educated and they have these experiences, but they also have their own context and the way they grew up and their own, um, you know, shall we say, levels of consciousness or whatever based on their own prior experience, um, there's lots of learning that can be had. And over the past several episodes, you've kind of taken a deep dive into consciousness. And I listened to a few of those episodes, and and I, I'm really curious about, you know, why consciousness? You know, because you kind of, you, not, I don't know, like, you know, we know each other for many, many years, but and I'm not saying or implying that you were never interested in consciousness, but you did take kind of a pivot and start to go in the direction of new territory with consciousness. Yeah, it's a little bit out of the the, the wheelhouse of scientific uh, polarizing issues in society. It mainly, it was it was my personal interest. Yeah, talk about that. Talk about why consciousness and what you kind of learned through those those episodes. I know you did your summary of consciousness, but you know, if you had to highlight two or three things that were like, really like, wow, I'm so glad I did these interviews because it's kind of helped me, you know, pivot a little bit or re- reframe what I thought I know compared to what I now know. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, it may seem like a, a step out for me. It's maybe a step out from my podcast theme. Uh, so I was a little worried about how it would be received. Uh, but definitely it was just, you know, something I've always been interested in. And, and you know, you, you say that it's, it, you know, it maybe doesn't seem like something that I would do, but you know, that, that, this is the journey of exploration that we're all on is to understand, as you say, it's to understand our place in the universe. And, you know, that's, that's why I went into physics is, is to understand what do we know about the universe? You know, this is. I wanted to learn, I wanted to know everything that we knew about the universe and I wanted to, to understand. And then, you know, at the end of it, I didn't get all the answers, right? We don't have all the answers. We, we know very little about our universe, actually. Uh, and, you know, from science, we can predict things very accurately. We know how the forces of nature interact, how, you know, if you drop something, how long it will take for it to fall. And the theories that we use, the mathematical theories that we use to predict the universe are undoubtedly correct. And, you know, the quantum electrodynamics has been proven to something like, or been verified to something like 20, 22, 23, 25 orders of magnitude. It's it's the most accurate theory we have of anything. And nobody really understands what it means. Right? This is, we don't know why the universe is like this. It's really weird. Like quantum mechanics is the the dreams that stuff is made of. It, it things are you know if you're not observing something, it doesn't exist. Or, and and in that way, the, the theory is a little bit incomplete. And the other thing that it that we don't have a good handle on is is why we are like we are. Why do we have experiences? Why do we have first person subjective? experiences at all right why are we conscious what what is consciousness and and you know this is something that i've been interested in to understand where this comes from what is it do we have a soul is it uh are we just biological robots that process information with neurons i wanted to understand what what we and un- what we know about this what what our state-of-the-art science is what religious viewpoints are in this and i wanted to just put it all out there and find out where we're at you know it's kind of a lazy man's way of learning a field really it's just interviewing the 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 top researchers in it (laughs) uh 
but yeah, I've had some really cool interviews. What what was shocking? To, yeah, what was shocking to you, or what was like wow, like kind of awe inspired awe in you? So, I think the uh, neurobiology stuff is the was the most wow to me. The the things that we're learning about uh, the brain and and how it interacts with drugs and anesthetics, like. Um, you know, we, we don't know, any, we can't define consciousness. There's no good definition of consciousness out there. It's very subjective. You can't put an objective definition on it. And so some people even say, you know, it's, it doesn't exist. It's an illusion. Um, consciousness. And that's what you call qualia. Yeah. Right? Qualia. Qualia. Yeah. These, yeah. these first person experiences. How do you, why do we have them? Or why do we believe we have them? Uh, but some of the some of the interviews I've done, um, Luca Turin, for example, is a great interview. This is a, a researcher who's um, uh, broken a lot of ground in the sense of smell and understanding how we perceive smell. And he's like a the god of perfume, basically, um, which is based on emotional classical conditioning, right? Like how the Pavlonian thing, like how how you can smell something and it triggers something in you is that part of it i don't think he went that direction it was more along the lines of how do molecules uh trigger smells uh and why do they okay. trigger such different smells like what are the actual physical processes that that do that and he was able to uh to find or to prove that uh despite what people people thought it was the shape of the molecules that interacted with the sensors in your nose. It was just molecules yeah. of certain shape would interact with sensors in your nose and create certain smells. But there are molecules of vi widely diverse shapes that create similar smells, and molecules of similar shapes that create widely diverse smells. Very sim simple molecules uh, or atoms even that have smells. And what he um, determined was that there's actually uh, the vibrations of these molecules is what you're actually detecting uh, as smell, or there's some aspect of the vibrations of these molecules and the spectrums of, of vibrations that they they interact, and, and there's some sort of a quantum interaction going on there with your sensors in your brain and your nose. Uh, and it's like, whoa, this is crazy. I, I, and this ties into a lot of the theories of consciousness that are coming from the, 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 the philosopher physics type area where they're saying, well, maybe quantum mechanics is tied to consciousness. And, you know, I don't buy into any of these theories. They're, they're very speculative at this point, very interesting to look at, but I feel that, you know, just saying quantum mechanics is like a God of the gaps for consciousness because just because we don't understand it enough. I think at this point we don't, know the right questions to be asking about consciousness and we're only just getting to the place where we can ask these questions uh, and there's so many diverse fields feeding into this problem like there's um the mathematicians the physicists the philosophers the neurobiologists and you've got um these these people that are looking at, at quantum physics and uh, neurobiology and combining the two uh, to make theories of, of consciousness. It, it's, it's really a, a very um, an interesting field for, for ripe for discovery. And the, the discoveries that Luca Turin was talking about are, are something that can be experimentally um, investigated to see if uh, our brains are like quantum computers. Where, where is the processing happening? We know that artificial intelligences can 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 do things similar to humans so, you know ais can defeat the world chess champion but you you can't just go up and ask them normal questions that you would ask another person these these are kind of idiot savants you know yeah you can't have them facilitate a board of directors meeting and and tap into everybody's you know kind of uh, where they're at, their emotional state, and to read their emotional state. But, you know, when you're talking about this, so I'm going to give you something to map off of. And a lot of my work has been around positive psychology. 
And kind of, you know, I, I mentioned this uh, researcher in my, my talk, I think the Pecha Kucha that I gave a few weeks ago, but um, Dr. Martin Seligman is the kind of founder of the positive psychology movement. And he was a clinical psychologist for decades. And then he just got so fed up with, can I swear on your podcast? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. With looking at why the world is so fucked up that, you know, he got so tired of that question, why people are so messed up to flip the paradigm and say, actually, let's look at what's working. And, and what, you know, if you were to look at your life and you were to really scan for evidence in your life, what evidence do you have that will contradict the beliefs that you have about yourself in this present moment? And so it's, it's that idea of, of, he calls it being a researcher of good and scanning for the good and really looking at the things that are working rather than the things that are not working. And then that calls into, um, or highlights or spotlights that idea of the power of gratitude, such a simple thing. So Martin Seligman, when he worked with clinically depressed patients, severely depressed patients, he taught them the skills to be to um, to journal about gratitude on a daily basis. What are three things? He called it the three W's. What went well, right? What are three things that went well for you? So for a severely depressed patient, clinically depressed patient, maybe what went well for them is that they actually got their ass out of bed and they walked and they took a shower that day because otherwise they would have been, been in bed for seven straight days. So that's a win. And then maybe it's, it's a warm cup of tea that somebody served you. And then maybe it's when I went to the mall, somebody held the door open for me. So what he does is he says, it's not just fluffy gratitude. It's really narrowing in on what you're grateful for. So if it's I got out of bed today as hard as it was. I got out of bed and I took my first shower in three days. It's initiative. So what he does is he makes them write it down. And in parentheses, he puts what it represents, initiative. And then maybe it's like somebody served me a great cup of tea and parentheses, uh, kindness. And then maybe somebody held the door open for me, parentheses, um, respect. Right. So the idea is that you journal about this on a daily basis. And when you do that with regularity, it changes the neurochemistry in your brain. You begin to rewire your brain to not look at why life is so messed up, but to look at what's good about life. And then you start to build on that. So through his research, he found that it had a, a a strong impact on stabilizing their depression. After seven or 14 days doing this every day, but they had to be taught the skill of doing it and why it's important and why they should continue to do it. So then after doing it for 30 days, it had a profound impact on their uh, mental health for the next six months after that. Okay? So can you? I don't know if you can, but it's just a question. But in your, you know, your interviews with people and learning about consciousness, and can you map off of that and start to kind of lay down some some points of reference that tie into that? I think that's that's a very uh, very wise approach. So we've learned a lot about. In, in recent years about brain plasticity back uh, you know decades ago when when I first was learning biology they they said we learned that the brain is plastic when you're a, when you're a teenager and your child but then the adult brain is not plastic and it just you know you they, they were in the mindset you can't teach an old dog new tricks your your brain uh, freezes after you get out of puberty and you're stuck with the brain that you have. And we've learned a lot to find that that's not true. Brain is plastic 
at all ages and learning. And, and this is, this also feeds back from neural networks. Um, th we've learned how neural networks process knowledge. And this is how we've built these uh, computers uh, to beat the world chess champion. We, we, we can model groups of neurons and how they reconnect and how they strengthen connections that are used to provide results uh, that you're using, that, that are useful to you. And so neural networks can learn by strengthening what uh, they're doing. So this looking at, you, you can see how, how people uh, spiral down in depression by thinking about depression. You know, I'm, I'm angry, I'm depressed. I think about this is horrible. This bad thing happened, and it's a it's a horrible spiral because you're thinking about depression, so you're strengthening the neural connections that focus on depression, and that part of your brain gets bigger and bigger and takes up most of your processing space. It's an actual physical change to the neurons. Can I just add to that? Is a lot of the work uh, with Dr. Jim Blair, who's written a you know, a number of bestsellers, but the power of story, um, leading with character. And he devoted decades of research into this idea of the power of personal narrative. So that's exactly what you're saying is that once you start the downward spiral, then you are, you know, self-fulfilling pro prophecy. You are creating this disempowering personal narrative which will just confirm the story that you believe is correct about yourself unless you throw a wedge into it, unless you disrupt it, right? And that's literally throwing a wedge into the neural network that has been planted and continues to grow like a, the big oak tree uh, on your parents' farm back in the day, right? So, so just, I didn't want to interrupt there, but I just want you to continue with the importance of recognizing when it's happening and then the evidence would show that you can absolutely create a new narrative and new neural pathway to create a new story yeah no that, that's exactly it and that by writing down these positive things being grateful or thankful uh, focusing on the positive then strengthens those neural networks uh, that focus on the positive. So your innate responses become more positive than they would otherwise be just because those neural networks are strengthened. And it, it's, it's amazing how, you know, we don't really know very much about the brain, but we're learning. And some, some of the studies that they're doing are, 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 are quite uh, ingenious about how the, uh, looking at, you know, uh, training, uh, people to get rid of, um, phantom pain if they've lost a limb, right. Um, they have this area of the brain that represents the limb and, and it's not, it's stuck in a, in a bad way. You know, it, it creates pain, but you can't fix it. There's nothing you can do. The limb doesn't exist anymore, but the area of the brain is still there. So you need to re, there are ways they can actually retrain that area of the brain to, to no longer recognize itself as the limb, uh, or people who have had strokes uh, and lose functionality in the brain, they they train the brain to use different areas that are still alive. Uh, to, you know, you basically have to relearn language or walking or eating, uh, and and the brain is very plastic and it's able to adjust to these these huge um, changes uh, or or you know strokes or, or or disease or whatever and and can bring on new neurons to to do the work of other neurons that are now dead uh so we're all the time we're training our brain and that i think um one of the interesting things is memory um nobody really knows how memory is stored in the brain which is a really crazy thing you would think this is something that we could figure out um but it seems to be like distributed in in patterns maybe in patterns of neurons um, and, you know, this ties back into the fact that memories aren't, um, permanent, right? We store memories by thinking of them. And the more we think of them, 
the more we can recall. But each time we think of them, we can change them. Or change what they mean. And that's that consciousness, change what they mean to us, right? This ties into the unreliability of eyewitness accounts in, in the judicial system, right? Because you, know, you can change people's memories. They may have, a, people have, researchers have been able to implant memories in people's heads just by saying, do you remember this? And they weren't sure, yeah, but, but there was this and this, and they could actually implant false memories into people's minds to have them believe them as if they were there. One of the things you said about your, in your summary of consciousness is, you know, we, we, uh, we act a lot on past observations and that we're defined by my rec recollections of past observations and that it's the interplay of emotions with consciousness and emotions obviously influence us. So we have our thoughts, our memories, our emotions. Now, if we were to really think about this uh, and, and how thoughts, memories, and emotions are stored in the body, the work of Dr. Gabor Mate, a uh, famous, very well-known Canadian psychologist, he's almost 80 now, um, and he's, he's written several books on this idea of how the body stores thoughts, memories, and emotions. And he was inspired by the work of uh, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote a book called When the Body Keeps the Score. Have you heard of that book? So what he then Bessel van der Kolk uh, inspired Dr. Gabor Mate to write a book called When the Body Says No. So what you're talking about, this idea of emotions interplaying with consciousness. And when people have these negative emotional experiences in childhood, as Dr. Gabor Mate says, it is um, manifested in physical symptoms of illness later in life. So that we store these negative emotions at, in certain parts of our uh, body. And the somatic experience would have us drop into the body to sense where the the uh, bottleneck points are or the the tension is that we're holding in the body, and then that's where you're you're storing it. So again, I go back to your your work around consciousness, and I go, holy shit, there's got to be a connection there. You know, like if we're creating a story and we're we're basing everything, you know, all of our past experiences and, and emotions on, you know, if we're basing everything we currently do on past experiences, then, you know, we're, we're really locked into certain ways of, of feeling and being. So I just want to throw that back at you in terms of the physical manifestation of stress and anxiety and depression and trauma as being stored in the body. So how, just, how does that resonate with you based on your understanding and, and um, what you want to share with people about potentially the science behind that? I haven't heard about that idea about storing i mean certainly researchers have proposed the idea that memories are stored throughout the body there was um um i think matthew fisher uh is a researcher in the u.s who's been looking at um the possibility for uh the body to actually store um isolated nuclear spins in certain particular molecules uh, in the mitochondria and the mitochondria of course are in every cell of your body and that maybe this is some sort of a quantum computing uh, memory of some sort these qubits that you you can store in your body um, and it's a very interesting speculation but i wouldn't gift it with more than a speculation at this point you know it's not uh, it, it's an interesting idea to entertain um, but I, I haven't seen, um, 
I haven't seen a lot of evidence for it. I guess I would be I would be somewhat skeptical of it to start as 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 a good scientist is when encountering a new idea. <laughs> but you know, if if you could see people who have you know, if there are evidence of people that lose limbs and then lose memories because of that, or, or, or maybe, you know, you could get a transplant from someone else and get their memories. Um, now people have, I don't think done those studies. Uh, and there are, there's anecdotal stuff about that out, that runs around. Uh, but I don't, you know, I don't know how, how, how much credence to give something like that. And that's where, where I'm at right now with my work. And my wife has been, uh, she trained under Dr. Gabor Mate. He, he wrote a book called the, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, When the Body Says No, Scattered Minds about ADHD, especially in adults, adults who uh, display symptoms of ADHD. And he has kind of linked it back, but he's the first one to say that there is not, you know, we, we have, we don't have a lot of science behind us right now. So he's just opening up the doors of possibility when it comes to discussing how the impact of trauma and stress and anxiety locks itself in the body and manifests itself in physical symptoms and how working to recognize where the tension and that, you know, that lock is held in the body and releasing that then frees you up of the, the physical symptoms. And so he's very early, even though he's close to 80, he's still early in his research around this. And he's on a world tour right now because he's releasing a new book uh, talking about this. So, you know, there, there is a, I, I think there, there is, appears to be a link between this idea of stored memory and where we might hold it or feel it in the body, which goes back to this idea of consciousness, right? So I think it's a fascinating conversation when you bring the two fields of, you know, mental health and, and well being and your work in science and then kind of opening up this conversation where people know very little about right and so i think that that's that's a really interesting kind of uh that's been my take on you know what i've learned through mental health and well-being and interviewing you know well over 200 now guests in this area you know it's been fascinating to hear their research and what they what they've learned through it all so i just wanted to kind of tag that on to what you're saying yeah no that that as, as i say that's that's one of my guilty pleasures is, is talking with all of the all of the experts that i would not otherwise have a chance to to chat uh chat with um so like what what have what, what's some of your best uh interviews what what, what would you say you've been the the most uh, surprised or, or gobsmacked by? I, I think it goes back to the, the human experience, just that it, not gobsmacked or in awe, but this idea that, you know, everybody going back to, you know, what Robin Williams said to, you know, in a quote, you know, a few years before he died is, everybody is fighting a battle that we know nothing about and and really opening those doors to discussions to realize that everybody has this very contextual experience in life where they're trying to figure it out as they go along and they're trying to do good work and this is the path that life has brought them on and then through these discussions really better understanding what they've learned and I think the common thread that runs through everything is open-mindedness and not being so locked into what we think is right, but this idea that it is a journey. And as you say, like science has its hard facts, right? You know absolutely 
the laws of physics and, and certain laws that will present themselves 100%. But when you sit around a table with people in a meeting, suddenly everything changes, you know? And then you have these personalities that are, that are kind of uh, interweaving among other personalities in the meeting. And then suddenly you have these dynamics in play and then the meeting shuts down because of conflict, right? And that's what people don't understand. People are trying to understand what makes a great leader and how a great le leader can navigate that space and bring all voices to the table. And then what a great leader needs to let go of within themselves to be able to bring out the best in other people, to lay their ideas on the table and to then shut down the rude, disrespectful critic that just is arrogant, but then also bring out the voice of the person who's quiet and passive that is incredibly insightful, the introvert. And this incredible balance are trying to find that fine balance between bringing everything out. That's what I'm most in awe of. And I think it's not one cold hard fact or one guess. It's this idea of a journey of exploration into understanding the common humanity of people through these discussions and and then starting to then lay down some some layers of science behind it you know so that you can better understand it so i think for me that's what it's been about and it's been fascinating and i and i love it and i just continue to be moved by it and drawn to it and uh and continue to learn from it so yeah indeed that that's something that's, that's changed a little bit in my perspective and maybe i've learned this recently um and that is you know we're we're all on this journey and we're trying to self-actualize we're trying to find happiness you know we're, we're and i think the mistake that a lot of us make is that we envision the end goal of happiness like I'm going to, I'm going to do a podcast and make a lot of money and then I'm going to be able to relax and be happy. Or I'm going to win a Nobel Prize by doing science and then I'll be happy. But you can't envision the end goal. You shouldn't envision the end goal as being happy. What you need, I read this recently, what you need to do is figure out what struggle makes you happy. Because you may never get to the end goal. And it's the struggle the day-to-day -day things that you're going to be doing in whatever job or 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 thing that you take on that you need to enjoy so don't picture the end goal picture the struggle to get there picture the day-to-day -day shit that you have to go through to get to where you want to be and find out which of these struggles you are going to enjoy waking up to every morning you know that that I f was really enlightening to me because I was thinking about it the wrong way. Well, that's beautiful because that, again, I've already mentioned Dr. Jim Lair, uh, who's coached 17 world number ones in their sport over the last three decades or four decades, including Andre Agassi and Pete Sampras and uh, a number of other. He was really into tennis, but his work led him from sports psychology and high performance into uh, this field, exactly what you're describing. And and he did a couple decades of research into fulfillment. And what he found is fulfillment is embracing your personal narrative and the journey and the ups and downs. And there is a professor, um, I've tried to get him on the podcast. His name is Dr. Fred Peel. I don't know what university he is from in the States, but what his research has shown is that the the people who perform at their best regardless of industry are the ones that have a good grasp over their personal narrative and the ups and downs of their personal narrative and that their personal narrative you know the ups and downs the fa failures the successes everything is moving them towards a greater understanding of self others and their craft so you know, you can train three things. You can train your body physically, you can train your mind, and you can train your craft. And that's all you have. You know, that's what you can 
you know, when you talk about an internal locus of control, that's all you can control. That's what you're doing with your podcast is you're, you're taking internal locus of control. You're taking your understanding of the world and past experiences. And then you are trying to create a better understanding of what you're curious about and then sharing that with your listeners. Now, your listeners, some episodes may, may resonate and people will be writing in their journal and then be deeply moved to take action. Some episodes will not resonate, and that's the nature of the human spirit and what we're, we gravitate towards better understanding. So I think that idea of the, the personal narrative and, and trying to understand the path we're on and what we're trying to understand and ask the right questions and continually open ourselves to this growth and learning is what it's about. So Dr. Jim Blair, his research would suggest that if we are not, you know, we don't have a crystal clear understanding of what our core values are, doesn't matter what, what somebody else's core values are, but if your core value is curiosity and compassion and knowledge, then everything you do will align to curiosity, knowledge, and compassion, whatever it is. And then you can use those core values as a vetting system to filter out all the decisions that you make that will then springboard into your thoughts, your words, your actions. So at the end of the day, if you are living in alignment with your core values, then you're on track and you will be fulfilled. And the most fulfilled people in, in the world are the ones that hold true to those core values, right? And um, so I think that's what I'm toggling back and forth with and grappling with within myself and learning about is like the importance of really distilling down to like on our fingertips what we value most in life and then doubling down on everything we do to explore what that means in our own context, in our own life. And then those will be the guests that I bring, bring on my show. And those will be the guests that I learn from. And those will be the, you know, the, the future guests that I, that I seek on my podcast. So when you think about if we were to segue into, you know, the end of the podcast and what we've learned, when you think about your core values, which have come alive through your 112 episodes. Um, and I saw it in your Petticucha when you, you know, were here in Windsor. But if you hold true to your core values, and the core values can shift, and, and they can change a little bit. They're not anchored in and cemented in. But the real core, if you hold true to your core values and you project 10, 15 years down the road, and you think of your work ten or fifteen years down the word, uh, down the down the road, what is it that you desire, or what vision do you have, and how do you want people to kind of remember the the work you put out in the world? Hmm, oh, that's a, that's a, a good question to to, to end on. Um, yeah, I my goal is to make a difference to leave the planet a better place uh, than where it's headed and I, i'm not going to say a better place than when i got here because I, I don't have all the power in the world but to make a, a positive difference um, based on uh, what i know to be true uh, so that uh, things can can move forward because i, I i'm very optimistic i, I think there is uh, a better future that we can that we can hope to achieve uh you know like a, a star trek future i think there is that that's still in the cards for humanity we don't have to be you know we're at a very crucial time i think in the evolution of of our species and the future paths that we might take and we've opened up the possibility of the space age and 
we've also opened up the possibility of a very dystopian future. We have the tools to create either at this point. And, you know, we could, we could be in Mad Max beyond Thunderdome, or we could be in Star Trek. And I'm working very hard with my podcast. And I hope, you know, someday people will look back at it and say, well, if it wasn't for that rational view podcast, things would have gone a lot differently. That's the sort of thing that I, I would like to see. Yeah. And, and that's again, holding, holding true to your core beliefs and remaining open-minded to uh, what the future holds and how you can navigate that space and, and share your own truth. And that's, that's what I'm doing through mine is, you know, I'm always trying to not reinvent my podcast. That's the wrong word, but I'm always trying to uh, double down on the things that I believe in most and then find people that I can have conversations about. Because for me, it's about uh, creating a better world through mental health and allowing or not allowing, but uh, inspiring people to think about what is possible within themselves if they get the conditions right. You know, and if you get the conditions right, then that's when true potential is revealed and will continue to be revealed. So I really appreciate the discussion we had today. I, I love our conversations. I, I think you're amazing at what you do. And I'm so grateful that we reconnected and that we both gave our Pecha Kuchas, which, by the way, for our. Yeah, our, no, your, thank you. That was good. Yeah, your listeners and my listeners. Um, the video is still coming. I'm waiting, uh, but I'll, I'll send you the video when I get it. And uh, you can share that with your audience of your great talk. And um, I'll share mine as well. And uh, yeah, but in closing, uh, you know, any guests coming up that you're pretty excited about or that you've reached out to? Yeah, I've got uh, a couple um still coming on consciousness or, or that I'm, I'm, I'm working on, on getting, um, it's kind of a, a bit of a lull right now in the summer. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of in between topics at this point. I'm, I'm, I'm transitioning. I had a couple, uh, I'm going to do a couple talks on, on bullying and how that affects people. And I also want to, uh, maybe start a new one. I'm thinking to, uh, that I'm going to start a, a, a series on maybe nuclear fusion uh, as a just look at the where the research has gone in that field uh, because it's something that's always a little bit out there you know it's going to save the world but it's it's always you know 20 years away so I just wanted to see there have been some some people that have been getting excited about it recently uh, so I wanted to, to dig into that and see where it's going how about you where are you where are you headed next um, I have this uh, guest da Daniel Pink who's an amazing author. He's a, a best-selling author. Uh, he was Al Gore's fr former speechwriter. Um, I've reached out to him several times, and he is obviously very busy. Uh, but he wrote a book recently. It was published about three months ago called The Power of Regret, How Looking Back Can Help Us Move Forward. And uh, I'm really looking forward to getting him on the show. Uh, I. I'm pretty sure I'll get him on before Christmas, but you know, it's not about getting the big guest, although he's amazing. It's about more just the opportunity to speak with people who are figuring this shit out too, you know, and they, they are the first ones to admit, I don't know the answers. You know, I, I'm just trying to figure it out, you know, in this, this life journey. So that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, we're, going back to Saudi Arabia next week and then we'll get back into another year of work in Saudi Arabia and that's it but I do look forward to connecting with you again and um, thanks for your time and I will let you end the show well thanks so much Andy it's uh, been a pleasure chatting with you uh, again thank you for inviting me for your Pecha Kucha that was a, a, an interesting experience and and um, hopefully uh, have more topics in the future to discuss. I'm looking forward to seeing the video. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much for coming on. It's a great chatting with you. Uh, we'll have to do this again.
If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page at patreon.podbean.com slash The Rational View. Thanks for listening.